Okay, so why don't we get uh, why don't we get started here? I'm Steve Levitt. I'm the director of the the Becker Center, and um, we have been in existence now. I don't know, it's uh, three or four years, trying to uh, f make the world safe for our brand of economics that <laughs> uh, brings theory together with data to try and understand how the world really works. And I must say, of all our uh, things we've attempted to do, the the one on which we've been most successful, I think is uh, with the postdoc program we put into place to bring uh, promising young economists to the university with the hopes that they'll have such a good time uh, while they're here at the Becker Center that they'll want to stay. And it turns out that Jesse was our inaugural such postdoc, and uh, he's one of the stars of the job market, but because of his experiences at Chicago, uh, he chose to stay here at the GSB. And because of that, we are graced with his presence today as he talks to us about Media Slant. So, Jesse. Thanks a lot, Steve. Are we good on sound? All right. So, uh, I'm Jesse Shapiro, and uh, I wanted to thank you guys all for coming, uh, especially today, which, you know, based on recent experience, could turn out to be the only nice day for the next six months or so until, until the next season rolls around, that season, of course, being July 4th. Um, this is... Uh, I'm going to talk today about the economics of news media slant, and to the extent that any of my own work, I'm going to talk about work that's been done by a number of economists over the last few years to try to understand the news media. To the extent that I'm going to talk about my own work, it's going to be work that I've done in collaboration with my colleague, Matt Jensko. And so some of you have probably taken Matt's strategy course. Um, and so you'll know that if the things that I say sound well thought out, uh, carefully considered, that's due to Matt. But if it's at all entertaining or humorous, uh, that's all Shapiro, OK? So, um, so I'm going to talk about Media Slant. And Media Slant is the way that an outlet, a news outlet, uh, conveys events. Okay? So a slant, the slant of a news outlet is the color or tinge that the outlet puts on some set of facts. Okay? And I think the best way to illustrate what I mean by that is with an example. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three opening paragraphs from three different news stories, from diff three different news websites about the same event which took place on November 30th, 2003 in Iraq. Okay? So the first paragraph from the first of these news stories that I wanted to show you reported the events as follows. In one of the deadliest reported firefights in Iraq since the fall of Saddam Hussein's regime, U.S. forces killed at least 54 Iraqis and captured eight others while fending off simultaneous convoy ambushes Sunday in the northern city of Samarra. Okay? And you can try to guess for a second what news outlet that is. If, as you're reading it, you're thinking, boy, this coverage is extremely fair and balanced, uh, you'd be right. Uh, this is the first paragraph from foxnews.com's coverage of this event. Okay? Now, the second first paragraph that I'll read you reported the events as follows. American commanders vowed Monday that the killing of as many as 54 insurgents in this central Iraqi town would serve as a lesson to those fighting the United States. But Iraqis disputed the death toll and said anger against America would only rise. OK? So you can contemplate for a minute who reported this. This is from the New York Times, OK? All the news that's fit to print and so on. Okay? And now the last uh, of these first paragraphs that I'll show you, certainly the most entertaining, says that the U.S. military has vowed to continue aggressive tactics after saying it killed 54 Iraqis following an ambush, but commanders admitted they had no proof to back up their claims. The only corpses at Samara's hospital were those of civilians, including two elderly Iranian visitors and a child. Okay? And perhaps the most fair and balanced of all, uh, this is from Al Jazeera.net, okay? Posted at exactly the same time, basically on the same day as these other two reports, okay? This example encapsulates very nicely what I'm going to mean by media slant, okay? These three outlets, through, you know, selective uh, emphasis, selective de-emphasis, different credibility assigned to different sources, are able, without committing any factual errors as far as I'm aware, are able to convey very different impressions of what took place on November 30th, 2003 
in Samara. Okay? And what I want to convince you of is that this is not an isolated incident, but rather this kind of power, the authority to convey different impressions of the same underlying events, is intrinsic to what we're asking from the news media. Okay? And to give you a better sense of what I mean by that, I'll turn to a quote by somebody so learned. His name was actually learned. Uh, this is a Supreme Court judge named Learned Hand. In a very famous Supreme Court case called Associated Press versus the United States from 1945, who said that news is a deliberate pruning of and culling from the flux of events. Were it possible by some magic telepathy to reproduce occasion in all its particularity, all reproductions would be interchangeable. But there is no such magic. In the production of news, every step involves the conscious intervention of some news gatherer, and two accounts of the same event will never be the same. Okay? So I'll interpret it in my own words. What I think that this paragraph is meant to say is, we can't be everywhere at once, okay? Experiencing everything directly for ourselves in the first person. That's the whole reason we have the news media in the first place, okay? To distill events into a form that's possible for us to digest in a relatively short and efficient amount of time, okay? But because they're ultimately going to be distilling events and choosing what to emphasize and who to quote and how to source and, and assign credibility to different sources, okay, we're, gonna, we're, we're intrinsically giving them authority to convey different impressions of the same event. There's no way to divorce what we're asking them to do from that authority. Okay? That's how I would interpret this quote, and that's why uh, I think the phenomenon of media slant is so interesting. It's not an isolated incident, but rather fundamental to the service we're asking the news media to provide. Okay? Now, we could stop there and say, look, we know that in lots of areas of business, the same thing can be packaged or flavored differently. Okay, so maybe media slant, the way that we package the news, is just like what color we put on the cereal box, okay? Or just like what flavor of ice cream we sell. And I think if that's all we thought was going on, this product category wouldn't be any more interesting than any others. It wouldn't be any, speci any, any more special than ice cream flavors. And by the way, there's a very good study out by economists at Stanford, Wharton, and Kellogg about uh, how firms choose their ice cream flavor. So I'm not trying to denigrate ice cream flavors, but I think probably a lot of the reason we're interested in this product characteristic in particular is that we think it has the potential to have broader social and political consequences. Okay? So a hypothesis that I think underlies a lot of public interest in the news media is the hypothesis that it affects how people see the world, how they're going to vote, and ultimately what public policies will be enacted. Okay, everything from you know, uh, fiscal policy, tax policy, monetary policy, all the way on out to you know, who we should go to war with. Okay? So I guess the, the first hypothesis that I would want to try to address with data in order to justify studying this in such detail is the hypothesis that media slant matters for things other than just what kind of media people are going to consume. So I want to tell you about some research that attempts to answer that question. And this is not our research. This is research done by Stefano De La Vigna at uh, UC Berkeley and Ethan Kaplan, who's currently at the Stockholm School of Economics. And this is a research project that they term the Fox News effect. Okay. So what is the Fox News effect about? Well, you already are, from, your, from your chuckles when I put up that quote, you're already very familiar with the Fox Cable News Network. I think it's probably fair to say it's a little bit more right-leaning than previously existing cable news media, all right? And it was introduced in the 1990s, okay? And what Delavinia and Kaplan try to do is to study what was the effect of introducing Fox News to the cable system in the 1990s on the way people vote for president, okay? So let me tell you a little bit about their research strategy. How did they go about answering that question? Well, they. You guys probably know more about this than I do, but my understanding is that the way that you get a network like Fox is that your local cable company has to basically add it to at least one of their packages. Okay? So the way that I get Fox is Comcast includes it on whatever uh, cable package I have. I don't know what it's called. It's, it doesn't have HBO, but it has most other things. Um, and I've recently been informed that it's not HD. My wife played a trick on me. Um, okay, so. Your local cable company has to add Fox News to this slate 
of available networks, okay? And that's the, the variation that Delavinia and Kaplan try to exploit in their study. Now, a naive way to go about studying what they want to study, which is what's the effect of Fox News on the change in Republican vote share in an area from 1996 to 2000 would say, look, a lot of places in the US got Fox News in the late 90s. Let's just look at what happened to the percent of people voting for Republicans between 1996 and 2000 and call that the Fox News effect, okay? That would be a very strange and naive approach. Most of the change in the Republican vote share from 1996 to 2000 has to do with other effects that one could write other papers about, like the Bob Dole effect, or uh, the George Bush effect, or whatever other effects you want to isolate. And not surprisingly, even in towns that don't get Fox News from 1996 to 2000, there's a big increase in the Republican vote share, owing to these broader national trends, right? So in 1996, Bill Clinton basically cleaned Bob Dole's clock, okay? But in 2000, George Bush almost won the presidential election, okay? So there was a big, there was a big change between those two years in the Republican vote share, okay? So what they do is they try to identify a set, of, they try to use this change that we observe for towns that don't get Fox during this period as a kind of baseline or control sample. And then what they try to do is identify geographically very proximate towns, okay, so very close to these non-Fox towns and identical in other ex ante respects that did get Fox News added to their cable system between these two time periods. Okay? And what they see is that even though these control towns start off similar, they end up a little bit ahead in their likelihood of voting Republican. Okay? So the increase from 1996 to 2000 in the Republican share of the two-party vote is just a little bit higher for these towns that get Fox between 1996 and 2000 and, and the towns that, uh, just a bit higher for those towns than it is for the towns that don't get Fox News between 1996 and 2000. And academic life is such that, you know, you, you run this whole study and they, they spent quite a lot of time collecting resources, collecting data, and then you write your paper about this little sliver right up here that they call Fox, the Fox News effect, okay? Because that's what it takes to isolate subtle things like this from big trends like that, okay? So turns out that, you know, A, this, is, this difference here is statistically significant, but then we can also ask the question, is it economically significant? Is this a large number? Okay, and it turns out it's about half a percentage point. So getting Fox added to your town's cable network increases the two-party, the Republican share of the two-party vote by about half a percentage point on that order of magnitude. And then we can ask in various ways, is this a big number or a small number? How should we think about magnitudes in a context like this? Well, there are various ways to look at it. A couple that I don't like so much and then one that I particularly like one way to make it seem really big is to say, well, it accounted for 200,000 votes. That is, the Republicans got 200,000 votes they wouldn't have gotten had there been no Fox News introduced during this period. Or more importantly, it was about 10,000 votes in Florida. So comfortably enough to have changed the outcome of the election. But of course, that's true of almost anything. Uh, almost a bus breaking down could have changed the outcome of the election in Florida because it was so close. So I don't think that's a really good way to think about it. But one calculation that they do that I do like is to say, well, look, this is half a percentage point change in voting, but not everybody watched Fox News. And some of the people who watched Fox News would have voted Republican anyway. In fact, probably a disproportionate number of them would have voted Republican anyway, given the facts that I'll show you later. So what they do is they try to adjust for those things and then ask the question, what fraction of people who watch Fox News change their behavior as a result of that from something that they would have done otherwise. So what fraction of people who watch Fox News either vote Republican when they otherwise would have voted Democrat, or go to the polls when they otherwise would have stayed at home? And they find that something like 10 to 30 percent of Fox News viewers change their behavior, which to me is a pretty substantial number. Okay? So taking their results at face value, the introduction of Fox had a really substantial impact on Fox viewers political behavior, okay? And then the point that I want to make is this is not an isolated piece of evidence. It says so right here on the slide, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to go into detail about the other pieces of evidence that one could bring to bear on these questions, but I think we're accumulating quite a good body of evidence that media content can affect political opinion, that it can affect voter turnout in a big way, 
and that the introduction of television in the 1950s may have had a big uh, part to play in the decline in voter turnout we saw in the post-war years. That uh, media content influenced federal spending during the Great Depression. Okay? And that media content influences US disaster relief policy today. That's a particularly nice piece that basically shows the following. I don't know if any of you guys are going to go off and run any foreign countries. But if you do, I suggest that if you're going to have an earthquake or a hurricane or some other kind of natural disaster, do it during a slow US news week. Okay? If you do it during the Monica Lewinsky scandal, it turns out you will not get any help from the US. Because your story will be buried on page 10, and no one will hear about it, and Congress will not act. Okay? But if you do it when there's not much going on, it isn't the World Series or the Olympics or a big scandal brewing, no elections going on, that's great timing, and you're likely to get substantially more disaster relief that way. Okay? So I want you to keep that. If you take nothing else from this talk, that piece of practical advice, I hope, will go with you. Have your earthquakes during a snow, slow news week. Do not do it like the weekend before the Super Bowl or during the World Series or something like that. It really is not a good idea. Okay? So there's really a lot of evidence, not just the evidence that I went over in detail. And if there were more time, I'd tell you about the methods for all these different studies, all of which are pretty interesting. Okay, and this one Matt actually did. Okay, so what do I take from all this? All right, I guess the message that I want to take away from this research in economics that builds on earlier work in political science and communication studies is that a, as I said before, the news media have tremendous authority to change how they portray events. Okay, and B, what I take from this quantitative evidence is that that authority gives the news media power to change people's hearts and minds. Okay, change how people vote, and ultimately to change what public policies governments are going to undertake. Okay, which to me as an economist begs a natural question and response. Given that the news media are endowed with that power, how do they wield it? And taking the example of Fox News in particular, what's driving the fact that Fox looks different from CNN? Okay. Is it Rupert Murdoch? Is it a desire to reach a certain customer niche? Okay. Or is it something else entirely? And that's what the remainder of the talk will be about. Okay. So let's try to answer that question. And as I said, I think the big broad reason why that question is interesting is because we know that the media are endowed with this power to change the way events are portrayed and then ultimately to change how we see the world and what public policies will enact. But if you're not convinced by those motivations, there are more specific reasons to be concerned as well. First of all, there are business consequences. So when, when Rupert Murdoch was looking to take over Dow Jones and ultimately the Wall Street Journal, there was a lot of concern raised about whether him doing that, his doing that would result in the Wall Street Journal's content, news content looking like the news content on Fox News. Okay, was he going to foxify the Wall Street Journal? And ultimately, that question turns on a question about whether the reason Fox is the way it is is because of something about Rupert Murdoch, or whether it's because of something about uh, the customers they're trying to reach. This issue also has important consequences for public policy. The Federal Communications Commission in the US has extensive regulation of broadcast media ownership. And one of the core principles behind that regulation is that a larger number of independent owners will tend to generate a wider array of viewpoints in the media than would a comparatively smaller number of owners. And then this is my favorite part of the quote, we believe this proposition even without the benefit of conclusive empirical evidence. Okay? That's like, that's when I hear cha-ching. Okay, this is an opportunity to do some some economic research to try to fill in a gap in our understanding of the world that's important for public policy. Okay? And I'll say a little bit more later about why they have to believe it without the benefit of conclusive empirical evidence, why it's been so difficult to generate good evidence on this question. So again, this to me, you know, given my perspective on research, this to me you know, smacks of opportunity. Quotes like this say, there's something that's important about the world. It speaks to more basic issues. It has direct policy consequences. And then there's, for some reason, we don't know enough about it. Okay? And some of you in the room took my class, so you know that I don't get out of bed in the morning without some kind of model. Uh, so the first thing that Matt and I did when we tried to, to tackle this question is to set out, well, what's the simplest economic framework we can think of that makes sense and is going to let us think about issues like how will news outlets trade uh, trade off catering to their customers against their own 
potential political ideology. Okay? And I'm not going to go through the formal detail, but roughly speaking, the way we've thought about it is, in, their, in our simple stylized world, media firms have two objectives. One, they want customers, which could mean readers or viewers or listeners. Okay? And two, hypothetically, it's possible that their owners might have a political ideology. So it could be that Rupert Murdoch has opinions on matters of public policy or politics. I wouldn't know. But if he did, he might have an interest in having his news outlets convey the news in a way that's consistent with his ideology. Okay? And if these two forces are in harmony, there's no conflict. But if they disagree, if what the customers would like to see differs from what the owner would like to see, then the firm's going to have to face a trade-off. And it's going to have to decide how much, the owner's going to have to decide how much they're willing to pay for their ideology. Okay? So that's the framework we set out with. And then we try to understand this question. So the first way that we wanted to understand how these trade-offs might work is to get into the question of what it is that media customers want. So if we're going to try to figure out how consumer demand is going to shape the content of the news, we need to know something about what that demand looks like. Who is our customer and what is our customer looking for? And not surprisingly, the strongest piece of stylized evidence that you'll see in this literature is that consumers gravitate to like-minded sources. So here's a very typical graph that you might see. This is from data from the Pew Research Center. It basically says that the more liberal somebody is, roughly speaking, the less likely they are to watch Fox News, the more likely they are to listen to NPR. Okay? Now a deeper question that I think we don't fully understand, but something on which Matt and I have tried to make some progress, is the question of why you see this pattern. Okay? There may be psychological explanations that say people just prefer to hear their beliefs confirmed, and some people have tried to work through those explanations and see how far they can push them. We've proposed another way of thinking about it, which is that when an outlet tells you things that are consistent with your existing beliefs, you're more likely to regard that outlet as being of higher quality. Okay? So to give you a concrete example, suppose that you go to LA, I'm going out there next week, and you're listening to a weather report, and you don't know anything about this station. So you don't know if it's a reliable weather forecaster or not. And the weather forecaster calls for eight inches of snow tomorrow in Los Angeles. Okay. Chances are, if you, if you think about it a little bit, you will conclude that probably this weather forecaster is not very good. Okay. Because it's not going to snow tomorrow in Los Angeles. All right. And similarly, if a news outlet tells you things that are radically inconsistent with things that you hold dearly and really strongly believe, you're going to tend to regard that outlet as being less accurate on average. Okay? So that's the explanation that Matt and I have put forward for this. And there's some evidence that's at least consistent with that hypothesis, okay, although it's not conclusive. So for example, if you take this Pew survey and ask people whether they believe all or most of what a given news outlet says, first of all, almost the majority of people say no, they don't. But among those who say yes, they're much more densely populated among outlets that are con whose, whose uh, slant is consistent with their prior beliefs. So very liberal people say that NPR can be trusted and Fox cannot. Very conservative people say that Fox can be trusted much more than NPR. Okay? So one of the possible mechanisms through which this tendency to gravitate to like-minded sources may be working is a desire to find sources that I regard as accurate. And given the limited information I have to go on, one of the ways that I do that is to gauge what the source is saying against what I, hold, what I already believe, okay, the beliefs that I strongly have. So if I believe it's very unlikely that US troops abuse prisoners in Iraq, and a source emphasizes that very strongly, I may tend to regard that source as having less accurate information on average. Okay? So the important takeaway, I think, you know, I don't think that the, the, I think the jury's still out on what exactly is the underlying causal mechanism here, but I think it's pretty clear that uh, customers gravitate to like-minded sources, which to me, as an economist, raises the following question. We've seen that Fox News affects its customers. Do its customers affect Fox News? So is there evidence that news outlets are catering their content towards the prior beliefs of their customers? Are they trying to target their content to what their customers already believe? Okay, and this is something that we've we and others in the literature have termed demand-driven bias, okay, for obvious reasons. The idea that slant or bias is driven primarily by a desire to cater to my customers. Okay? And there's a really good documentary film that I highly recommend that you all see called Control Room, which is about Al Jazeera. And in that documentary film, 
The film ultimately, although it's really the story of Al Jazeera, it ultimately becomes the story of Lieutenant Josh Rashing, okay, who works as a press agent for the US military, and over time comes to understand better the incentives of Al Jazeera, comes to adopt their perspective. And what he says is, it benefits Al Jazeera to play to Arab nationalism, because that's their audience, just like Fox plays to American patriotism for the exact same reason. So Rushing is endorsing exactly this view that bias is primarily demand driven. That the differences in those paragraphs I showed you at the beginning come from the fact that Al Jazeera is trying to sell news to a different audience than Fox News. But in order to, to answer this question to our satisfaction, we wanted to go beyond quotes and anecdotes and get into large scale quantitative evidence. Okay? That's tended to be difficult to do. So people for a long time have tried to quantify the political orientation of news outlets. And that's a challenging thing to do because, you know, when you buy ice cream, the flavor is printed on the box. But when you buy news, the flavor is not printed on the box. They don't tell you this is how we're going to spin the news today. And that makes it difficult to measure, especially since the news is a really rich, complicated, multidimensional object, okay? It can't be represented by a number. If it were possible to represent it that way, the newspapers would be a lot thinner, okay? You can't represent news in a number. It has to be represented in text and images and layout and so on. And that makes it hard to quantify on a single dimension what it is that, uh, the newspaper, how it is that the newspapers are characterizing the news. Most of the way people have, most of the way technologically people have, have tried to overcome this problem in the past is by passing the news through a filter called a graduate student. Okay, so what they do is they take a few thousand news articles and they hand them to a team of research assistants, undergraduate or graduate students, and they ask them to characterize the news outlets without, you know, these people are blind to the hypotheses of the study, ideally. And they ask them to characterize the news content as, say, you know, pro-Bush or anti-Bush or pro-McCain or anti-McCain or what have you. Okay, and that's great. Uh, over time, that's been a very good employment program for many research assistants. So not to knock undergraduate and graduate students, but that technique has tended to be relatively slow and not very amenable to scale. Okay, so it tends to be difficult to do that. You can do a few thousand with a great grant. You can do 10,000. But if you wanted to do 10 million articles, uh, you, would start, you would start to run into some trouble with, with your funding sources, I think. Um, and it would take a little bit of time. So uh, I think in part for that reason, lots of existing evidence, and I think this comes back to that FCC quote, lots of existing evidence relies on very small samples, like six newspapers or 20 newspapers or a dozen newspapers. And to me, uh, you know, that seems like a limited way to try to learn about these questions. So we're going to do something a little different from that. Uh, we're going to try to cut these, these hand coders out of the equation altogether. And the way we're going to do that is by studying the political use of language. All right, and I'll give you an example to illustrate what I mean, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about the details of our procedure. Okay, so a good example of the political or strategic use of language comes from a memo that was written by this guy, Luntz, who's a very famous political consultant. And this memo was intended to be read by 2006 Republican congressional hopefuls, and it contains a lot of great advice. Okay, so another thing that could come out of this uh, talk for you, a lot, a lot, another piece of value added is, if you're thinking of running for Congress, you can check out the Luntz memo for how to talk about things. So his, his advice is about many things, but the best part for me is that he talks about what words to use. Okay? And when he talks about the social security debate in particular, he says, never say privatization or private accounts. Instead, say personalization or personal accounts. Two thirds of America want to personalize social security, but only one third want to privatize it. Why, you ask? Personalizing social security suggests ownership and control over your retirement savings, while privatizing it suggests a profit motive and winners and losers. Okay? So, he doesn't have footnotes that indicate what data he uses to support this claim, unfortunately. But um, I guess we'll take him at his word that he's done some focus groups or other analysis that tells him that if you want people to support social security reform of this type, I won't say what it is because I, don't, I want to avoid using charged language. Uh, if you want to, people to support this type of reform, you better call it personalization. And then we went in the, into the 2005 congressional record to ask, do people in Congress take this advice seriously? Well, in fact, it turns out that in the 2005 congressional record, among speeches, there are almost 200 instances of Republicans saying personalization or personal, or sorry, personal accounts 
as against maybe 50 instances for Democrats. And if you turn to private accounts, you want to see how well organized the Republicans are, you turn to private accounts, Democrats said that over 500 times, and Republicans said that about five times in 2005. So the way that people talk about issues corresponds very closely to the advice Luntz is giving. And I take two lessons away from this. The first, not very surprising economic lesson, is that people who are trying to get you to support an agenda are going to tend to use the language that's going to make you like their agenda. It's going to make it sound as good as possible. And then there's also a more mechanical or statistical lesson that I take away from this, which is if I knew nothing else about somebody in Congress in 2005 other than how often did they say personal accounts and how often did they say private accounts, I can make a pretty good guess about what party they belong to. Okay? And that's the logic we're going to use to develop our slant measure. Okay, so how are we going to do that? The first thing we did is use an automated procedure to identify phrases that are used much more often by one party than the other, like personal accounts or private accounts, or global war on terror, or it turns out actually if somebody said war in Iraq in 2005, that was probably a Democrat. Um, tax cut for the wealthiest, if somebody said that in 2005, that was probably a Democrat. Okay, and you can, you can go on and on. We used a, a kind of computer procedure to just identify phrases that are going to be highly diagnostic of the speaker's party. And then we used another computer program, again with apologies to research assistants everywhere, to search databases of news text for these partisan phrases and to count how often each of a set of newspapers used each of these, we ended up with about 1,000 of these phrases, how often each of a set of newspapers used each of these 1,000 phrases. And then we just used a statistical model to ask the question, if this newspaper were in Congress, which congressperson would it be? So, if there were somebody in Congress who talks like this newspaper, how Republican or Democrat a congressperson would that be? Okay, that's a kind of more precise statement of this same idea. And remember what I said about scalability. I think if we wanted to identify as tightly as possible the slant of a small number of news outlets, we probably still would have used uh, humans to filter the news. But uh, for going up to 400 US dailies representing more than 70% of the circulation in the country, you really can't beat a computer. We had to do, you know, for, so roughly speaking, 400,000 searches, and, and uh, the computer's a lot happier to take that job than uh, UFC undergrads tend to be. Okay? So this is how we kind of got around this scale problem. And then to give you an idea of the kinds of phrases that are in there and whether they indeed do help you diagnose the political orientation of a news outlet, I'll give you the most extreme comparison we're aware of which is the comparison between the Washington Post and the Washington Times. And for those of you who don't know, these are two Washington, D.C.-based papers. And I think in relative terms, most people would not dispute, and you'll see why, the claim that the Washington Times is just a bit to the right of the Washington Post, or if you prefer, that the Washington Post is just a bit to the left of the Washington Times. Okay? So let me give you some examples of headlines I'll show you pairs of headlines mostly describing the same events on roughly the same day using very different language to describe the same events. So when same-sex marriage became legal in Massachusetts, one of these newspapers, I won't say which one, said that same-sex couples line up early for a marriage made in Massachusetts. And the other newspaper said homosexuals marry in Massachusetts <laughs> in scare quotes. I won't say which newspaper is which. I'll let you figure that out. Okay. One of these newspapers talked about the anniversary of Operation Iraqi Freedom and the other of the anniversary of the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq. Okay? On pretty much, you know, again, pretty much the same day. One of them talked about the uproar wrought by religious films, in quotes. The other about faith-based films. One of them talked about lawmakers tackling the death tax and the other about the estate tax. One of them talks about tax cuts. The other talked about tax relief. One of my favorite uh, phrases. Okay, and not surprisingly, because we rigged up the example to work, uh, it works really well. And in every case, you would have correctly identified which paper is which from these pairs of quotes. Okay, so conceptually, that's the logic that underlies what we're trying to do. And then there's some some quantitative detail behind it, but basically, this sort of says it all. Okay, so. 
When we compute our index, which again helps us to ordinarily rank newspapers, not absolute, in absolute terms, but just in ordinal terms, gives us a sense of who's relatively little, liberal and relatively conservative. Things line up reasonably consistently with one's expectations for big papers like the San Francisco Chronicles to the left of the Houston Chronicle and the Washington Post is to the left of the Washington Times. Okay? And then what we can do now, armed with this quantitative tool, is to start asking questions like, does the data, do the data look consistent with the hypothesis that news outlets are trying to customize their news to match the prior beliefs of their customers? And indeed, if you look, for example, at the share of the time that a newspaper says death tax relative to a state tax, that's much greater in conservative places than in liberal places. Okay? And if you look at our index overall, it also has that pattern, although it's a little less pretty than this beautiful death tax graph. So you, know, look, you can look at this one. Okay? And then we can ask, well, once we hold constant the characteristics of the types of customers the newspaper is trying to sell to, does who owns the newspaper seem to have any additional statistical information about its content? And it turns out that at least for our data, it doesn't. That holding constant the character that where the newspaper is trying to sell its news, there's no evidence that two papers with the same owner look more similar than two papers with different owners. Okay? A good example is uh, the New York Times. The New York Times company owns you know, the New York Times, uh, but it also owns some other newspapers including the Spartanburg Herald Journal, at least it did in our sample period, which is in South Carolina. Okay, and that newspaper, despite the fact that the New York Times is relatively liberal on this, in the scheme of things, that newspaper is smack in the middle of the distribution of South Carolina newspapers in terms of its political orientation. So looking at this picture, you wouldn't have been able to guess, I think, which of these newspapers was owned by a relatively liberal newspaper in New York. Okay. So, what do I think we learned from all this stuff? And then I'll tell you a little bit about where we're headed next. So first of all, I hope that I was able to convince you that it's pretty fundamental to what the news is trying to do that different sources are going to treat the same news very differently. Okay? Those differences can be quantified. Not perfectly and not noiselessly, but it is possible to make progress in pinning numbers to those things and letting us look at broad patterns in the data. And those differences do have the power to influence voting behavior and public policy. So they matter for things that the world cares about. So what do we think is going on? I guess right now, our simple understanding of the world looks like this. On the demand side, consumers are gravitating to like-minded sources, and that creates a non-trivial economic incentive for news outlets to target their content to suit the interests of their customers. And then in turn, we find that firms do that, that they do tailor their news to suit their customers. And that at least on the dimensions we've measured, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that owners are willing to pay to do something their customers don't want, but they would prefer. Now, I'll just give you a little bit of a flavor of where we're headed next. You'll notice that nothing in what I said really revolves around newspaper competition. But lots of questions now arise about as barriers to entry are lowered, due to technology and the rise of, the inter of internet media and so on, how will competition affect this kind of dynamic? And in particular, the kind of question that you might be interested in is how does the content of one outlet respond to the presence or the content of other news outlets? And it's something that we've tried to theorize about and are now trying to put some evidence to, to bear on. And to answer that question, we're collecting a new data set. So maybe I'll come back in a few years and give another one of these talks about it, which is a panel data set of all U.S. daily newspapers from 1932 to 2004, where we measure every four years their presidential endorsements, and then a number of other things about them, like their circulation and prices, posted ad prices and ad lineage. Uh, and we try to measure, we're trying to track all the mergers and entries and exits that occurred during this period, which was a pretty turbulent period with lots of activity in this industry. So with these data, we're able to put together cool graphs like this, which shows the history of the Washington, D.C. market and shows some of the exits and entry events and some of the mergers that occur using arrows to represent mergers, uh, which wasn't my idea, but I thought it was a good idea. Um, and then we can start asking questions like, when newspapers exit, do we see economic gains for their competitors? And then we can start relating those economic gains to things like how different are these newspapers in terms of their political orientation. And so just to give you a flavor for how that's going to look, we've started to look at some cases where there are two newspapers and one of them 
dies off. And we're generally seeing you know, pretty clear evidence that in a lot of cases, remaining newspapers pick up a serious amount of circulation. And then we've started to study to what extent is that pickup related to how different the newspapers are in this characteristic space, in this, in this product space. So how, how, much, how much does it depend on how similar or different they are politically? How much does it depend on how similar or different they are in other dimensions on which newspapers are differentiated? And you'll have to stay tuned because I don't, I don't have a concrete answer for you just yet. Thanks very much. So I'll be glad to take some questions if you'd like, and, and I'll try. If, you, if I don't remember to repeat the question so that everybody can hear it, just stop me and remind me. Yeah, back there. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. We we have not. So there has been work. I didn't talk about it. There has been work by economists, not us, to try to figure out whether the identity of who advertises in my magazine influences, you know, what I say. Uh, and there does seem to be evidence, for example, that in mutual fund magazines, if if I'm reviewing a mutual fund that's owned by a firm that advertises a lot in my magazine, like if I'm smart money, that I tend to be more favorable, all things equal, to that mutual fund. So there has been some evidence emerging on that. In this new work that we're doing historically, we actually have data uh, for at least some of the years on the amount of advertising lineage these papers are running. So we may be able to bring that in to what we're doing. Other question? Steve. So the average newspaper, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't repeat the question, nor did I do it before. Uh, Steve's question is relative to Congress, how liberal or conservative is the average newspaper? Okay, so I'll give you a, an answer and then an extremely long uh, qualification. So the, the, I'll actually start with a short qualification, then go to the answer, then the extremely long qualification for those of you who are following along with a checklist. Okay, the short qualification is our measure is intended to capture ordinal variation. So it isn't intended to answer Steve's question. That said, I will now answer Steve's question. The average newspaper talks like a congressperson from a 40% Republican district, which is pretty liberal. Um, the broader qualification is there are lots of differences between newspapers and, and, and Congress people that could cause average differences in the way these two kinds of outlets talk. So, you know, newspapers are written. Congress people are talking. This is spoken text in a lot of cases that's been recorded. And newspapers are trying to tell you what happened. Congress people are telling you, tell you, trying to tell you what should happen. So there might be lots of things that are going to cause average differences that, wouldn't, that could but wouldn't necessarily upset our kind of ordinal principle. But that is the, that is the answer from the data. So I, this is a, a significant weakness of, of, oh, sorry, I got to repeat the question. Thank you. Okay. The question is, ultimately, at some level, a human being is making this decision about what phrase to use. And when they're making this decision, how are they doing that? Have they read the Luntz memo or what principles are they using to guide them? Okay. So my answer is a significant weakness of what we've done so far is a lack of really rich institutional detail. So I don't have clean quantitative evidence that I can bring to bear on exactly how these choices are made. I have anecdotal evidence. I know for a fact that for some of these highly charged phrases, news outlets are very conscious of what they're doing. In fact, the Washington Times recently circulated an internal memo that was then leaked that said that uh, they were no longer going to, to, to use the phrase, the, the word homosexuals, or to put marry in uh, scare quotes uh, anymore. So this is, these are conscious decisions that are being made at the editorial level. Another way in which these decisions are probably made, and again, this is just this comes from anecdotal evidence of discussions with people who run newspaper firms, is it probably has a lot to do with the selection of who you hire, both as the editor and then as the reporters and writers. So, you know, I think it's it's unlikely beyond these very highly charged cases that people are going through every word and deciding how it would rank on a slant index, but you probably have a lot of latitude in that by by choosing who you're gonna 
who you're going to hire. So that's the answer that I've got. Martha. Right. Well, it's so Martha's question is, how do they get that number? How do they go from half a percent impact of Fox News to 30 percent impact of Fox News? What was the sleight of hand? Um, so it's not, I mean, it's right that it's, it's, it's central to what I've said today. There is other evidence that news content matters. So I don't, I'm not resting the case on that one paper. But, but to explain a little bit more what they did, the issue is that you, know, you observe a half a percentage point of fact. Okay, overall on the percent voting Republican. But when you think about the accounting of that, suppose that you believe that people who did not receive Fox News in their homes or did not watch it were unlikely to have been influenced by Fox News, which is a non-trivial supposition because it could be that you're influenced by your friends who are watching Fox News or something like that. But let's suppose that that effect comes from the fact that people who watch Fox News change their behavior. So the first thing they did is they went to viewership data and they tried to study basically what's the effect of getting Fox News added to your local cable package on the, the likelihood that you will watch Fox News regularly, which amounts to just asking of people who have Fox News in their regular cable package, what share watch Fox News regularly. And initially, actually, there, that actually took, this took a lot of work on their part, because initially the way they were doing it was using some surveys in which I think the survey respondents were confused about the Fox network, which carries news programs, and the Fox cable news network, which is a 24-hour news program. So, there was a lot of work sifting through these viewership data, which are not perfect, to try to figure this out. So basically what they're doing first is kind of dividing by that number. They're saying, what is this 0.5% as a share of regular viewers? Then the next step is, some of the regular viewers were going to have voted Republican. They would have voted Republican if they watched Fox News or if they didn't. So those people, if you believe that the only effect of Fox News is to make you vote Republican, those people are kind of outside of the group who could be affected by this. Okay? Like if you were already going to go vote and you were going to go vote Republican, Fox News can do no more to help you, I guess, or whatever, however you want to look at it. Okay? So they tried to make an estimate, again, I think based on viewership data. This part I don't remember in it as carefully. Uh, I think they used, they'd make an estimate based on viewership data of the percent of people who would have voted Republican anyway and basically divide out again by the share of viewers who were able to be affected by this. So the share of viewers who otherwise would have either gone to the polls for the Democrats or not gone to the polls at all. And then th those are the two steps. And there's a fairly wide you know, confidence interval around those numbers. Other questions? Jenny. Yeah, the, our attempt, so Jenny's question is, you know, in general, there can be a difference between the op-ed page and the news content, and how do we handle that and what we did. Our, our basic approach was to try to the best of our ability within the limits of these online news databases to exclude editorial content. Um, there's probably some edit, there's, there, we know that there's some leakage of editorial content into what we did, and we have some idea of how much. Um, if you look at measures of editorial content, like a simple crude one would be the, the, whether they vote, endorsed a Republican in the last election, it's correlated with our measure. There's a fair amount of independent variation in the two, and actually we think some of the underlying economics may be pretty different, actually. But that's, that's something we haven't really worked that much on. There was a question back there. So the question is, as cable news has become more popular, there's been a blurring of uh, editorial and news, and maybe that's affected the extent to which people sort into their preferred kind of ideological bucket. Is that, and, and how would you hypothesize it would affect that? I see. So that over time, there's been a rising taste for opinion because people are getting accustomed to hearing commentary and analysis and not just, uh, not just the facts. Okay, so I'll tell you what I know. 
I don't think there's been much work on whether that's caused a change in the, the amount of this sorting. Um, there's been a little bit on, you know, whether the rise of the internet has created what people call echo chambers in which I only hear my own preferred ideology. Um, but I don't think we actually have a good answer to even that part of it. What I have heard is that the, the rise of, that, that something that, a different trend, which is the rise of like internet news and sites like Google News and stuff, have put a greater premium on news outlets that are known for analysis and commentary more than they are for reporting per se. So like The Economist, if you look at like new, news, print news magazines, US News and World Report, Newsweek Time, those have not been doing well in circulation terms at all. The Economist, on the other hand, which has much more of a reputation for analysis and commentary and synthesis, has been doing extremely well in the US. And if you ask them uh, why, one of the answers they give you is that they think that their analysis is complementary to, now it's easy to find out literally what happened. But if you want to know what you should care about or what you should focus on, then their, their analysis is, is a good way to learn that. So that's one way in which that trend's manifested. Right. Right. Um, so the question is, you know, we're saying that there's both an effect of the customers on the news outlets and an effect of the news outlets on the customers. Could that create some dynamic in which we run off to the extreme because you make me a little more right wing, I make you a little more right wing, and, and so on? Uh, I don't think we haven't we haven't done those kinds of calculations. I doubt the effects. In the, from the, I, the effects from the customer to the news outlets are big. The effects from the news outlets to the customer are you know, non-trivial, but you know, probably not big enough to generate uh, that kind of feedback. Um, you know, something that's going like, no, to have no, something that's going to have those kind of di non-stationary dynamics like that and not converge. But I don't know for sure. There's another part of what you're asking, which is an important question, which is when we're doing, making these graphs, like comparing what the cost, how people vote in this town to how this news content chooses to, to report, chooses to say death tax or estate tax, we have to deal with the fact that I've already asserted that how the news content, how the news outlet reports the news is going to affect how people are going to vote. So that complicates doing that graph. And what we try to do is find things that are going to shift how people vote that are not going to be directly affected by news content, like demographics and things like that. Um, so that's how we've tried to handle that problem. Other questions? Don't feel obligated. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming. <laughs>